This video continues on Unit 3 Biology Chapter 1 of your book and it's going to be looking at some of the molecules that are involved in living organisms. Now first off, I'm going to put up a periodic table. What this shows is, is all the different types of elements that occur on Earth. Now as far as life goes, there's only a few that are very, very important. Over 99% of all organisms, their weight is made up of mainly four elements, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen and oxygen. And there's a couple of other minerals that are also important such as sodium and chlorine and these are used in some quantity. On top of this there's a couple of elements which are only really used in small amounts and these are called trace elements. The main ones to remember here are hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen and oxygen. Now by adding different elements together you get these things called compounds. An example of this, say we add hydrogen and oxygen together, well, we get water. Say we add a bit of sodium and a bit of chlorine together, well, we get NaCl, which is salt. Or say we get a whole bunch of hydrogen, carbon, oxygen, and add that together, well, we can get lots of different things. For example, we might get sugar, if we add it in the right proportions, that is. So, remember, the main ones are carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. So let's have a look at the different types of compounds that these make. First off, we're going to consider the major classes of compounds that occur, organic and inorganic compounds. Organic compounds are compounds which are very complex and contain carbon and hydrogen. Okay, and there's a couple of examples that are shown here. These can be literally thousands upon thousands of different combinations of carbon and hydrogen. They often also contain oxygen and nitrogen. Inorganic compounds, put quite simply, are compounds that are not organic. Okay, that's literally the definition. And we're going to have a look at one of the most important ones of these to start off with. Now, some of the ones that we will be coming up that are important are carbon dioxide and oxygen and also salt. But the only inorganic compound that we're going to be considering today is one that's very, very important, and that inorganic compound is water. Now, water, as you are probably aware, is very important when it comes to life. Okay, but water also has a couple of properties that make it such a great thing for life to exist in. First off, water is, contains two hydrogen and oxygen. Now, these are both charged, and it makes water a, a polar molecule. What this means is that water has a positively charged region and a negatively charged region. As you can see, positively charged where the hydrogens are, negatively charged where the oxygen is. Now this gives water some great properties. Because water molecules are polar, it makes them cohesive. And what this means is that water molecules tend to stick together. Where between different water molecules, hydrogen bonding occurs. Now hydrogen bonding is very, very weak types of bonding. Um, but it gives water a whole lot of different properties. Now, these bonds are so weak that when you step into a bath, you break the hydrogen bonds, otherwise you'd be able to stand on top of water, but you're not able to do that. But the hydrogen bonds between water molecules do certain things, and they cause things like surface tension, like this little insect over here is able to exploit, as well as this lizard. Now, this guy here, if he was to stop for more than a couple of seconds, he would sink but he's able to push himself along on top of these hydrogen bonds that occur between the water. Okay, and it is pretty cool and pretty amusing, I, I find, anyway. But water's properties of cohesiveness are not only important to uh, animals, they're also important to plants. The cohesiveness of water allows thin columns of water to be carried up tree trunks over 100 metres tall without breaking through these little holes which are shown here. And I'll let this guy explain it to you a bit better than that. Plants transport water and nutrients from their roots to their leaves through a vascular tissue called xylem. These are dead, empty cells which connect end to end, forming long, continuous tubes. Because water molecules carry a slight electric charge, they're attracted to each other. This natural attraction, known as cohesion, links the molecules in long continuous chains. At the leaves, water escapes the xylem and evaporates through microscopic pores on the surface called stomata.
as each molecule breaks loose, it pulls up another molecule to take its place. This continuous pulling tension extends all the way down the xylem tube to the roots. Here, the rising chain of molecules keeps pressure low, allowing water and nutrients to enter through osmosis. Oh, good. Thanks for that, pal. Now, the next thing you know about water is that water has a high heat capacity, and this, once again, is due to that hydrogen bonding which occurs between individual water molecules. Now, what a high heat capacity means is that water can absorb a great deal of heat with very little increase in its temperature, which is very important because cells are very active places, and they produce a lot of heat, but it means that the cell doesn't heat up as far as temperature goes significantly, which is important, as we'll see in later classes. Another great property of water is it's great at dissolving things. Water, being a polar molecule, is very good at dissolving molecules which are charged. For example, salt here, which contains the charged molecules of sodium and chlorine. What water is able to do is, with its hydrogen bonding, is it's able to separate the sodium and the chlorine ions and literally prevent them from rejoining up with one another, hence dissolving them. Now these polar type molecules which readily react with water like this are called hydrophilic which means water loving. But there's certain types of molecules which don't dissolve in water, things like oils. This is because these guys are non-polar and they're termed hydrophobic and we're going to be having a bit of a look at these a little bit later today. The major thing for you to know with them is water really doesn't like these guys. It can't form hydrogen bonds with them so it doesn't want to know them. So, that's all we're going to be having a look at as far as inorganic compounds today. We're going to start having a look at a few organic compounds. Now, organic compounds, as you probably remember, are complex chemical compounds that contain carbon and hydrogen. Now, the four main types of organic molecules we're going to be looking at are carbohydrates, we're going to be looking at proteins, also lipids, as well as nucleic acids. Now, we're going to be having a look at these fairly frequently over the next semester. Large organic molecules are called polymers, and they're made by the joining of many smaller units together. The smaller units are called monomers. So let's have a look at some of these organic molecules. The first one we're going to have a look at are carbohydrates. Carbohydrates are the most abundant organic compounds in nature. Amongst their many roles, they're a good source of energy, as well as they form a lot of structural components such as cell walls. They contain carbon, hydrogen and oxygen in the general formula shown here. Monosaccharides are single sugars, such as glucose. Things like disaccharides are where you have two sugar units joined together, such as lactose and sucrose. Or what you might have are polysaccharides, such as cellulose, where you join lots and lots of sugars together. Proteins are another type of organic molecule. They're also very important. They contain carbon, hydrogen, oxygen and nitrogen, and they can conform many, many roles. There's about 200,000 different types of proteins in the human body. They're made up of chains of amino acids that are joined by peptide bonds, and hence proteins are also called polypeptides. Now we're going to be looking at proteins a lot in lessons coming up, how they're made and what their different uses are. So it's good to get used to these. Next off we're going to be having a look at nucleic acids. Now nucleic acids are a special organic compound because these guys are the genetic materials of all organisms. There are two types of nucleic acid. One of them you've most likely heard of is DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid, which is a double-stranded type of nucleic acid. Another type of nucleic acid is RNA, which is a single-stranded type of nucleic acid. Both of these nucleic acids are made up by the joining up of lots and lots of little subunits called nucleotides. And we're going to be having a look at these a fair bit also within coming weeks. The final organic compound we're going to be looking at are lipids, or fats. These are made up of subunits of fatty acids, and they not only have a role which is great in energy storage, but they're also very handy because they're non-polar molecules. What this means is these guys hate water, and they make a great barrier between two different sets of water environments, such as that is in a cell membrane. We're going to be having a look at that in the next video. You should get to know these organic molecules really, really well. Anyway, good luck with that, and I'll see you next video. Bye.